and they all spoke the same language. After a while, though, man's numbers grew so large that he began pushing the animals out of their homes and out of their natural habitats. What was more is that man was a hunter who hunted with the deadly bow and arrow and the spear, and he would hunt the animals for their skins and for their furs and for their meat. The animals decided that this was enough. And they decided that they needed to remind man that man shares this planet with the other animals. So the first group of animals decided that they would call a great council to decide what should be done with man. The first group of animals to call a council were the bears. The chief of the bears is the great white bear, and he called his meeting at the mulberry place in the mountains. Together, he asked his fellow bears what was man's deadliest weapon. And the other bears answered him that it was the bow and the arrow. And the chief asked them, what is it made out of? The other bears answered that the bow is made out of a locust tree and the string is made with sinew made from their insides and their skins. The chief of the bears asked the others if they should wage war against man with his very own weapon. And the bears thought that this was a good idea. But in order for the bears to learn how to make this weapon, one of them had to sacrifice himself in order for the weapon to be made. So one bear voluntarily sacrificed himself so that sinew may be made from his skin and from his insides to make the long string that goes with the bow. But as the bears tried to shoot the bow, when they pulled back the string, their claws would get caught on the string. The bears realized that in order to hunt effectively with this bow and arrow, that they would have to clip their claws. It was then that the chief of the bears told the others that it would be better for them to hunt and to forage and to wage their war with what nature had given them, their teeth and their claws. Man's weapon was not made for the bears. And so they disbanded their council and they went their separate ways. The next group of animals to call a council were the deer. The chief of the deer is called the little deer. The little deer is fast and swift as the wind and can turn invisible. The little deer asked his people, what should they do to man if man is ungrateful when he hunts them? And the deer decided that if a man kills one of them, the little deer will go up to the blood of the dead deer and ask the blood if the man had given thanks before he killed the deer or if he hadn't. If he had given thanks, the little deer would go about his way. But if the blood told the little deer that the hunter had not given thanks, then the little deer would follow that hunter invisibly, go into that hunter's home and strike that hunter with rheumatism, crippling the hunter for the rest of his life. The next group of animals to call a council were the fish and the snakes. The snakes and the fish decided that they would send bad nightmares and dreams to the man so that he would, dream, he would dream of terrible, slimy things while he slept. The last council to be called was that of the insects and the little woodland animals. The chief to hold this council was the grub worm. And the grub worm asked his people if man was indeed guilty of pushing them out of their homes. And the other animals answered yes, the man is guilty of pushing us out of our homes and he has no regard for us. The frog said, the man doesn't even pay attention to where he is stepping anymore. So he steps on me and he hurts my back and my back is bruised and scarred. The only creature to speak up for the man was the little woodland squirrel. And the woodland squirrel said that the man never paid him very much attention, so he didn't bother him. But this made the other animals angry and they jumped on the little woodland squirrel and they scratched his back. And that is why the woodland squirrel has his stripes on his back. The grub worm then asked his people, what should they do to get back at man? Each of the animals then decided that they would create and make and name new diseases and new illnesses. And the grub worm asked each animal one by one the name of the new disease and the names of the new illnesses. And the grub worm was so pleased with their answers that he fell backwards, laughing with joy. When he fell backwards, he struggled to get back up. And that is why the grub worm struggles to get back up when he falls backwards today. The next council to be called was that of the plants. 
not the animals. When the plants had heard what the animals had done, naming and creating all these new and different diseases, the plants decided that they wanted to be friendly to the man and that they wanted to help the man and that for each and every new disease that every one of the animals had named, they would provide the cure. I will help the man, said the plants. If he calls to me, I will provide the cure. And so every grass and every moss and every tree and every root has a cure. If only we could find it. Wado. And thank you for listening to my story today. One moment. I would like to close out with a song on my flute. <laughs> But you had to be quiet a little bit. Okay. All right, Stone Glow. Um, I hope you enjoyed that story. Let's go to a different I, um, story. I was born in Pahaska, but grew up in Hold on. Tulsa. My Cherokee grandmother ah. gave me a trail machine when I was 11. the bears do to the humans? Can you see the screen? The bears, yeah, the bears did nothing, remember, they decided, come here, <laughs> say hi to everyone. Hi. Hi. Uh, the bears did nothing, remember the claws broke the um, the string of the bow. Yeah. Next question. Um, and I didn't know this title was ever that was okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, listen. Who is the leader of the bears? And this story was it the squirrel? The grub worm, the great white bear. <laughs> the great white bear. Um, who was the leader of the deer? The bear, the snake, the little blue deer. In another story, they describe him as the little blue deer. And if you guys know AC Blue Eagle, he draws this little blue deer. And you can research that. What did the little blue deer to the human do to the humans? They gave him them rheumatoid rheumatism. Next, what happened to the squirrel? Oh, they scratched his back, the other animals did, for speaking up for the humans. What did the snakes do to the humans? Gave them bad dreams. 
And so finally, what did the plants do? <laughs> make them mad, scratch the humans, or make a cure for all the diseases. Make a cure for all the diseases. And this is available at Poor Lojo website. <laughs> Oh, scratch, scratch. Next, we are going to do Grandmother Brings the Sun. I have noticed I got to click on it and then share the sound and let me know if I'm doing it right. And finally, a little voice from the back of the cave. <laughs> Long ago, they say that half of the world had the sun, but the other side of the world did not. And so all the animals living on this side of the world were always bumping into each other's and getting lost. Now, Wolf lived on this dark side of the world. So he had an idea. He gathered all the animals in a big cave. And he got up in front of them and he crossed his arms and he said, I'm tired of everybody bumping into me and asking me for directions. And he says, I have an idea. We should go to the other side of the world and ask them for a piece of sun. I think if we're real nice, they'll give us a piece. But Trickster Coyote jumped up. He was sneaky and foolish. He said, no, 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 if they're so nice on the other side of the world, how come they haven't given us a piece of sun already? He said, I, Coyote, have a better idea. Let's sneak over there and just steal a piece of their sun. <gasps> oh, no, said Wolf, we can't go do that. Oh, calm down, said Coyote. We're not going to steal a big, fat piece of their sun. We'll sneak over there, and we'll just take a little, tiny piece of their sun. They'll never miss it on the other side of the world, said Coyote. So all the animals in the cave looked at one another, and finally a little voice from the back of the cave said, Hey, send me. I'll go. Hey, I'll go. Who is that back there, said Wolf. Come on down where I can see you. So down to the front comes a round little animal with a big bushy tail, little ears, little eyes, and big fat chubby cheeks. And he was kind of shy and he raised his little paw and he said, hi, my name is Possum. I, I got an idea, I, I got sharp claws and I think I can dig a tunnel to the other side of the world. When I get there, I'll just take a little piece and I'll, hide it in my big bushy tail. Oh, Wolf said, oh, that's a great idea, Possum. So they went to a big well made out of dirt and Possum took his sharp cl claws and began to dig and dig. And, and Possum made a beautiful tunnel to the other side of the world. Now, Possum had never ever seen the sun before. And when he popped out on the other side of the world, the sunlight was so bright it hit his little eyes and he screamed, I can't see, he yelled, I can't see. Well, his eyes had been squinting to this very day and now you know why. Well, Possum took a little tiny piece of that sun and hid it in his big bushy tail. He turned around and he ran as fast as he could back down the tunnel. Faster and faster, halfway down, something started to get warm inside of his tail. But Possum didn't give up. He ran and ran, and, and something got hotter in his tail. And Possum soon ran into the cave where all the animals were waiting, and there was smoke coming out of his tail. Oh, no, all the animals yell, get some water, and they whoosh, 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 threw the water on Possum's tail. Finally, the smoke clears, and Wolf looks at Possum, and he says, oh, no, Possum, your tail's all skinny. It looks like a rat's tail. And Possum's had that skinny tail ever since, and now you know why. Well, what are we going to do, said Wolf. The sun burned out in Possum's tail. And a loud voice from the back of the cave said, hey, send me, hey, I'll go. Down to the front comes a big, tall bird with shiny, beautiful feathers. 
down to the front. He had a beautiful crown of feathers on top of his head. He was kind of a show off. He said, hey, it's me, big bad buzzard. I wouldn't be so dumb as to put the sun in my tail. I'm gonna hide the sun in my beautiful crown of feathers. And Buzzard didn't waste a moment. He jumped into the tunnel and flew all the way to the other side of the world. It didn't take him long at all. He came out on the other side and took, he took a piece of sun and put it on top of his head and he turned around and Buzzard flew, soared back down to his side of the world faster and faster and faster. And halfway down, something started to get warm on top of his head. But he didn't give up. He flew and flew and something got hotter and hotter and he flew into the cave and the animals looked up and they said, oh no, buzzard, your head. And they whoosh, whoosh, whoosh through water on buzzard's head. When the smoke cleared, Wolf looked at buzzard and said, oh no, you're bald. And Buzzard has been bald ever since, and now you know why. Well, what are we going to do now, said Wolf. Look at poor Possum, and now Buzzard, we still don't have any light. And just then a little voice from right above Wolf's head said, Cindy, I'll go, Cindy. Wolf looked up. He said, who is that? I can't see you up there. Come down where I can see you. Just then a little thread came down. And a little voice said, Cindy, stopped right in front of Wolf. Wolf looked down and said, oh, no, not you, Grandma. Well, this was Grandmother Spider. Grandma Spider crossed all of her many arms, and she said, I know I'm old, but I need you to bring me a ball of clay this big. Go on, she said. So. Wolf went and they brought a ball of clay about this big and brought it back to Grandmother Spider. And she sat in the middle of the cave and she began to pat the clay in all of her many hands. And she sang a little song. Hey, Anna, ya, hey, Anna, hey, Anna, ho. Hey, Anna, hey, Anna, hey, Anna, ho. And she kept singing her song. And when she finally finished, she had made a beautiful bowl out of her clay. Grandmother Spider never said another word. She picked up that clay bowl and disappeared into the tunnel. And she finally reached the other side of the world, but she wasn't alone. The sun guards were there, and they were mean-looking monsters. They had fire pouring out of their heads, and they had smoke coming out of their ears and steam pouring out of their nostrils. They were mean-looking monsters with their spears, and they stood there guarding their sun. But Grandma Spider was so tiny she sneaked right past the sun guard. She tiptoed up to the sun, took a little piece, and put it inside her clay bowl. And then she came back inside the tunnel. The sun guards never saw her. They never looked down by their feet. And she was safe inside the tunnel and came all the way back to her side of the world, carrying that little piece of sun in her clay bowl. Well, she came all the way to her side of the world. She came into the cave, and when she did, that ball of light began to grow and grow and grow. And this ball of light got so big that the animals pushed and squeezed the ball of light out of the cave until it bounced and flew off into the sky. So all the animals came out of the cave and they could see for the first time. And you know, they were so happy, they danced around Grandmother Spider. And from that day on, whenever she would spin her web, you could see the shape of the sun. And it's been that way ever since, and now you know why. And that's the end of the story.
All right, I hope you enjoyed that story. Let's go to the slide show again. Okay, so what is the moral of the story? No matter how big or small you are, you are so important. I like to tell this story because I do basket weaving and every time we start a basket with the round read, it looks like the sun and it looks like a spider. So I really just like to share that story as well. We are going to the Muscogee Creek stories. Um, origin of clans is next. And we're going to start at 403. Reminiscent of designs found on ancient Muscogee engraved shells. It is told by our elders that in the beginning, the Muscogee people were born out of the earth itself. They crawled up out of the ground through a hole like ants. In those days, they lived in the far western land beside tall mountains that reached the sky. They called the mountains the backbone of the earth. Then. A thick fog descended upon the earth, sent by the master of breath, Isagata Masi. The Muscogee people could not see. They wandered around blindly, calling to one another in fear. They drifted apart and became lost. The whole people were separated into smaller groups, and the people in these groups stayed close to one another in fear of being entirely alone. Finally, the master had mercy on them. From the eastern edge of the world where the sun rises, he began to blow away the fog. He blew and blew until the fog was completely gone. The people were joyful and sang a hymn of thanksgiving to the master of breath. And in each group, the people turned to one another and swore eternal brotherhood. They said that from then on, these groups would be like large families. The members of each group would be as close to each other as brother and sister, father and son. The group that was farthest east and first to see the sun praised the wind that had blown the fog away. They called themselves the Wind Family or Wind Clan. And as the fog moved away from the other groups, they too gave themselves names. Each group chose the name of the first animal it saw. So they became the bear, the deer, the alligator, the raccoon, and the bird clan. But the wind clan remained the most important of all. Among other things, that legend introduced us to the master of breath, also referred to as the master of life, or the one who is above all. Creek people visualize him in different ways, as you will see later in some of the other tales. Now we turn to myths. These are stories told to explain and interpret the nature of the universe and its inhabitants. These tales may explain the creation of the earth, the beginning of fire, or the gift of medicine. And many of the stories deal with a time when animals, Plants and people could all communicate with one another in a common language. Animal characters often behaved as men would behave, as we'll see in the next story, the creation of land, 
narrated by Woodrow Haney, who is a skillful craftsman, musician, and actor. The story has been illustrated by Mary Tiger Brown, whose artwork has received state and national attention. In the beginning, there was no land. Water covered all the earth below. So a great sky council was called to see if the world can be made into a good place to live. The eagle was chosen as leader of the council. He said, let us send someone down to the world to find earth from which we can make land. Who will go? The crawfish stepped forward and said, I will go down to search for the land. The council agreed to send the crawfish, but the eagle warned, you shall have only four days to find earth when you must return to the sky council. So the crawfish went down into the waters below. He swam around in the waters for three days, but could find no land. Finally, on the fourth day, the crawfish said, I must take one last look before returning to the sky. So he dived as hard as he could down to the depths of the water. There he struck something. It was earth. He began to stir up the mud with his tail. He collected some of the mud in his claws and piled it up high above the water. So on the evening of the fourth day, the crawfish returned to the sky council. There he stood before all the creatures of the council and revealed to them the wet earth that he had found below. The council was greatly pleased with the discovery of land, but they saw that it was salt. They asked, who will spread out the land and make it dry and hard? The eagle stepped into the middle of the council square and said, I will go below and spread out the land and dry it. So the mighty eagle spread out his long wings and flew above the earth. As he soared over the land, it began to spread out and dry. After a long while, though, he grew tired of holding out his wings, and he began to flap them. As he flapped them, he caused the hills and valleys to form because the dirt was still soft. But soon, the lands were dry enough for the animals to live on, and the migration from the sky to the earth began. The number four is a sacred number among most Indian tribes, representative of the four winds or four directions. That is probably the reason why the crawfish had only four days to discover land. The next story, also illustrated by Phyllis Fife and told by Susanna Factor, is another myth. It is called the coming of fire. As with most other tribes, the Creeks hold fire as a sacred gift from the Creator, a manifestation of the sun on earth. When the world was still new, people had no way to warm themselves or heat their food. They were cold in the winter and hungry all the time because their uncooked food did not taste good. One night, the master of breath took pity on them and caused a bright glow to appear in the sky. The light grew brighter and brighter. Suddenly, small objects shot out of the sky and fell to the ground. The people rushed over to find out what the bright objects were. One Indian brave found two of the glowing objects laying next to each other on the ground. They were small rocks. As he picked them up, the pain of the heat caused him to drop them. As they hit the ground, one rock struck the other, causing a spark to fly. The spark caught the grass on fire and it began to spread. At first, the Indian was frightened by what he saw and felt. 
that the master of bread spoke to him and told him not to be afraid. The master explained that the rocks were sacred and were to be used to warm the people and cook their food. Then the other Indians gathered around the fire as it burned brightly in the night sky. They felt it warm their cold bodies. Then the Indian spoke and said, this fire is good. It has been sent to us by the master of breath to warm our houses, cook our food and light our council. You must remember that the fire is sacred and must be kept alive always. Then he said, tonight we will hold council together and when we are finished, each woman will be given an ember from the fire to take to her home to start her home fire. Each year at this time, put out the old fire in your home and clean out the ashes. Then you must return to this council ground and receive a new fire to take to your home. And from that night, when the sacred rocks fell from the sky, Indian people have had fire to cook their food, warm their homes, and light their councils. Now let's look at the third type of folk story, the fable. Fables are stories told to teach specific lessons or morals. The Muscogee people use fables to build personal strength, to clarify values, and to promote acceptable behavior. Frequently, the main characters are animals, but the results of their actions can be held up as examples to humans. Our first fable teaches a lesson about generosity. It is called, How the Woodpecker Came to Be, illustrated by Freeman Mitchell, well-known Creek artist, and told again by Susanna. Once upon a time, there was an old lady who was gifted for making bread. Everyone far and near knew of her talent. Each day, she wore a black dress, a white apron, and a red scarf tied around her head. One day, an old man came to her house. He said to the old woman, I have walked many miles and I am very tired. May I rest and get bread and water before I continue my journey? The old lady said, yes, you may sit here on the porch and rest while I go in and cook some bread. She went in the house and got the fire started to bake bread even though she had very little flour. As soon as the oven was hot, she put the bread in the pan and placed it in the oven. The bread was soon done and when she took it out, she noticed that it had cooked perfectly. She thought to herself, this bread is too nice to give to an old man. I will keep the bread for myself. So she fixed another loaf and placed it in the oven. When it was done, the bread looked even better than the first loaf, and she decided to keep it too. She placed a third loaf in the oven. When this was done, it appeared to be even better than the first two loaves she baked. She finally decided that she did not have any bread to give away to strangers. She went outside and told the old man that she had been mistaken and had no bread to share with him after all. The old man knew that she was not telling the truth because he was really Hisagata Musi, the master of breath, and he had been testing her. Suddenly he threw off his old coat to show his true identity. Then the master said to her, something bad is going to happen to you today because you would not share your bread. He stomped his foot on the ground and the old lady's body began to shrink. She cried out, I'm sorry, 
I'm sorry. I will share my bread with you. But he stomped his foot again, and she began changing into a bird. Her arms turned to wings. Her black dress turned into black feathers. The white apron turned to white feathers, and the red scarf changed into red feathers. The master of breath said to the old woman, because you have lied to me, from this day forward, you and your descendants will have to peck wood to get your food. Therefore, the creek elders say, it is good to share your food with strangers, even though you have very little. The following fable is a typical trickster tale called Rabbit Gets Wisdom. The story was illustrated by Creek artist Carol Fife Stewart and is told by Susanna once again. Rabbit was very unhappy with himself, so he went to his socket in the sea, the master of breath, and asked him for wisdom. He said, I haven't much sense and would like for you to give me more. So the master gave Rabbit a sack and told him to fill it with red ants. Fill it, he said, and I will teach you sense. The master thought that if he did not have any sense, he couldn't get one ant into the sack. So Rabbit went to the ant hill and said, the great master has been saying that you could not fill this sack, but I said you could. What do you think? The ants were very anxious to show that they could do so, and all went in, whereupon Rabbit tied it up and carried it to the master. I have done as you told me, said Rabbit. Now give me knowledge. But the master said, first, there is something else you must do. There is a big rattlesnake over yonder. If you bring him here, I will impart you some knowledge. He thought if the rabbit was really ignorant, he would not know what to do. Rabbit went off with a plan in mind to find the snake. First, he cut a long straight stick and made one end sharp. When he found the snake, he said, the master says you are not as long as this stick but I say you are longer. The snake replied, well, I think I am longer. Go ahead and measure me. So the snake straightened out and Rabbit measured him by laying the stick beside him with the sharp end toward his head. As Rabbit was doing so, he ran the point of the stick into the snake's head and killed him. He carried the rattlesnake back to the master on the end of the stick. The master looked pleased and said, Now I have one last task for you. There is an alligator not too far from here. Bring him to me and I will give you wisdom. So Rabbit went to the lake and called out, Alligator, Alligator Harjo, come out. I must speak to you. Alligator poked his head above the water in the middle of the lake and asked, what's the matter? Rabbit answered, an ox has been killed for the master to eat and they want you to get some timbers for the scaffold on which to roast it. So Alligator came out of the water and followed Rabbit. Before they had gone far, Rabbit turned around and struck Alligator with a club. The Alligator ran for the lake with Rabbit close behind, beating him all the way. Alligator slid safely back into the water. Rabbit left to go think over what he would do next. In a little while, he went back to the lake and called to Alligator once more. Alligator Harjo! Alligator Harjo! Alligator came up in the middle of the lake and as before said, what is it? Rabbit cleverly said, 
Basakola the rabbit was sent here some time ago, and nothing has been seen of him since. Do you know what happened to him? Alligator suspiciously answered that someone had come to him with such a story and had beaten him. Rabbit spoke, saying, We thought he might have done something of that sort, for he is a mean kind of person. We told him to ask you to bring the forked timbers to roast a ox. When he didn't come back, I was sent to find out what happened. Upon hearing that explanation, Alligator came out of the water, and again they set off together. As they went along, Rabbit said, That Basakola is very bad. We should not have sent him. Did he beat you very badly? He beat me a great deal, said Alligator, but he did not hit a dangerous place. Then Rabbit slyly asked, If he had hit you in the dangerous spot, what would have happened? It would have killed me, said Alligator. Well, where would Basakola have had to hit you to hurt you? Rabbit asked. Alligator replied, If he had struck me across the hips, it would have finished me. And so, having learned what he wanted to know, Rabbit presently struck Alligator across the hips and laid him out dead. Then he picked him up and took him to his Saigata Sea. When the master saw that Rabbit had completed the final task, he said, You already have more wisdom than I could ever impart to you. And he told Rabbit to leave him and trouble him no more. It seems that Rabbit did get wisdom, but he was outsmarted in the process. Our final sample of Muskogee Creek folklore is actually a collection of short tales illustrated by Indian artist Tommy Steinsick. These stories focus on what the Creek people call the little people. Many stories are told about these helpful and fun-loving little ones who seem to be much like the leprechauns of Ireland. Woodrow Haney tells these tales for us. My grandmother, a Creek medicine woman, told me much about the little people, the Stilowitzki. They live in the woods. In summertime, they live in pine trees and a tree of the mistletoe. When winter comes, they keep warm by moving into the squirrel's nest. For food, the little people mostly eat berries. In the summertime, they love to eat kibala, strawberries. They also enjoy eating possum grapes and silava, or black hull berries. The Istilabutskuzi do not have a stomp ground of their own for holding traditional ceremonies. So, after the human-sized people end their ceremonial season, the little people hold their puskida or green corn dance. The Istilabutskuji love to play tricks on human-sized people and are often blamed for hiding misplaced objects. One morning at the stomp ground, a man was washing himself. He laid down his soap and towel near the water. But while he was washing his face, some little people moved the towel to a nearby rock. Then they ran behind a cedar tree and had a good time laughing at the trick they had played on the man. When the man had finished washing himself, he pulled out his clean clothes. He laid down the clothes on the bench and turned around to drink his coffee. While he was turned around, the Istilabuskuji grabbed his clothes and ran towards the woods with them. When the man turned around, 
He saw his clothes making a fast getaway towards the trees. He did not see the little people under his clothes, and by the time he caught up to his shirt, the Istilabutskuzi had disappeared into the woods. It is said that the little people do not like dogs. One morning, an Indian man and his dogs went hunting in the woods. As they passed by the trees where the little people made their home, a little medicine man saw them coming. He picked up a blade of dead grass and prepared himself to shoot the man. As soon as the hunter was near enough, the medicine man shot him in the back with the dead grass. That is why a hunter sometimes may feel a sharp pain when he is in the woods. These are some of the tales told about the little people. The next time you misplace something and can't find it, remember that the little people probably moved it and are off somewhere having a good laugh about it. And that concludes our visit with... Great, don't go. How we go? Teresa is here. She is also a member of Fort Lodger. Can I introduce yourself? Hello. Um, no. <laughs> okay. So now we are going to switch to our our slideshow. Okay. Questions. In the story in the origin of clans, what were the mountains called that the people crawled out of? Dun, dun, dun. The backbone of the earth. Next question. Y'all can write in the comments or speak up. Why were the people lost? The fog. They were lost in the fog. Who blew the fog away? I should have given y'all a couple seconds. <laughs> he saw Gadama see the master of breath. What did the group furthest east call themselves? Lodolgi or the wind clan. Next. Who was the leader of the sky people in the myth stories? The eagle. Who found land under the water? Crawfish. Cut out. How many days did the eagle give him? The sacred number four. Yeah. Coming of fire questions. What were the glowing objects? The story was interesting. Hot rocks. <laughs> All right. What did they do with the rocks? They made a fire. And they still practice these things today at the ceremonial grounds in, to keep the fire alive. Next is how the woodpecker came to be. How the woodpecker come to be? Teresa, can you answer that question? I don't think you can answer it, please. 
I can't actually, but I forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, she didn't share her bread. Oh, yeah, the old woman that would not share her food. Mm -hmm. she, she, she was the bread. best. <laughs> but she wouldn't share it. Correct. She got punished. That's why the moral of the story is to share. <laughs> share, share, share. So what, yeah, what does she have to do now to get her food? Peck her wood. Peck mm her -hmm. <laughs> wood to get food. That's exactly it. Oh, how the rabbit gets wisdom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> what is it? Uh, alligator Harjo. Hey, that was, was so cracking me up. And then he said, rabbit picked up his stick and knocked the alligator across the head. Like, hey. <laughs> that must suck. But <laughs> how does the rabbit get so much wisdom? Yeah. <laughs> you can ask the creator for wisdom and he'll give it to you. And it's a blessing. Mado, we're going to take a quick break and switch to the Cornhuff doll stories. Um, get your supplies ready. There'll be a little story first, and then we go into the making. We on our little quick break, we're going to see if we could share this to Facebook and and share this beautiful picture with you. Okay. Before we go, <laughs> this is where I was. You see this? This is my daughter. And Brittany painted her. And this is, we just picked it up. It is actually sold now. But it is framed, glass, everything.